Uh, the first scripture we're reading this morning is uh, Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now skipping over to Mark, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him. and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a surprise, it's a new year, right? And with a new year, we're generally offered, at least feel like there's some hope for the year coming up. A hope that it will be different. A hope for potential improvements, maybe in our life or the life around us or ourselves. A hope for change. A hope for a world filled with more peace and less violence. A hope for a community that uplifts as opposed to tearing it down. So in this new year, there's a bunch of hope. Uh, sorry, it's not a Star Wars themed message today. It's not, we're not focusing on episode six, A New Hope, but that is kind of the focus of hoping going forward. Uh, so you see, I feel this hope kind of comes from two main areas that we can look at and, and kind of focus on. Uh, so one is the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, which we just celebrated, right? That provided immense hope. A hope for the people, hope for us, uh, and the promises and the ministry that we are able to follow and call our own and carry that out in our life. But there's also another hope that often kind of gets overlooked. And that's where we begin in the beginning. Hope in creation. And so we go all the way back to Genesis where it all began. Uh, what we know and what humans know is the beginning of existence where the creation of light, uh, waters, inhabitants, the earth, all of that starts with immense hope. And you have to think that God had hope in creating the world. Uh, so it, it gets a little complex, but if you, you have this understanding and kind of uh, thought about theology or God or the world itself, and it was constructed into a thousand different puzzle pieces... I'm not sure we'd ever find all the pieces to put it together to understand. And that's how complex God is. That's how complex the world and our understanding of life and theology can be. And so we have this term, the Trinity, which tries to best sum it up. And three people as one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But even then, it doesn't seem to fill in all the gaps. There's some stuff that's just kind of missing. And so from a theological standpoint... And it's kind of reflected in this Trinity statement. And then our own language is rather limiting, right? Now, some things we just can't describe. Sometimes we have to make up words. Um, sometimes we have to just fabricate things or have these long, uh, crazy sentences to explain one little item. Um, and even in some languages across the world, there's some words that don't translate into English. So people just have different ways of describing things that don't always 100% uh, fill in their gaps in their mind and connect A to B. 
And so this contemporary way of saying Trinity is our best way of kind of describing God. Uh, and both kind of filling out this confusing puzzle and this theology and this life that we have and live. But how does it kind of help us understand God? Or who God is or what God really wants from us? I feel there's always more we can learn and get from that. So today's scripture passage, we begin in Genesis, which is in the beginning. And so we go all the way back to that. Uh, where light, the planet, water, plants, animals, all that, and finally humans were made. And so we should be careful to note of how exactly creation begins in the Bible. It does, in fact, begin with creation, right? It's the very first thing that's talked about. It's not uh, the selection of Abraham or the heir to the descendants as his ancestors. It doesn't begin with the election of Israel as God's a people. That starts in Genesis chapter 12. No, instead of all of that, it starts with creation. So that's the core, that's the essence, that's the genesis of everything, right? And so it begins with these very words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And not in the beginning, God created Israel or Abraham or Sarah or whoever you want to name or Adam. And now this is an important distinction to kind of keep in mind. At first, it reminds us that the sun rises and sets, and not just on Christians or Americans or Europeans, but the entire world, right? Everybody's touched by creation. It's not just for one person, one group, or one community, one area, or one nation. It's everyone in this world is impacted and a part of creation. Therefore, it's understood that God blesses all of creation, not just a small little portion of them. So it's helpful to keep this in mind, and it gives us hope that whenever we make mistakes or fail or fall into some traps that others have fallen into, we can maybe have that grace and that mercy to get out. And hopefully it kind of prevents us from falling into that trap in the first place. You see, it's very tempting for churches to develop exclusivity, and a sense of ownership when it comes to God. So Israel fell into this trap from scriptural history, right? Uh, the oneness or onlyness of God it came to mean the onlyness of Israel. And so as Walter Brueggemann says, a monotheism led to monotheism. So they, they came to believe that not only that Yahweh alone is God, but also Israel alone is God's. And so you see where you can kind of run into an issue with that. If we feel, you know, TPC is the only church, we are chosen, we are God's church, then we're blessed, and God's our God. It comes very possessive. So uh, when you get to that point, uh, this opened up the door to them believing that they were privileged and resulted in their own abuse of power. And so we have to know from history that abusing power uh, can be dangerous and quite tricky. Yet the abuse of that power does more damage in the long run, really. And it usually exhibits a distinct kind of lack of trust and faith upon the recipient of the abuse of the one with said power. So obviously this, this position isn't really ideal, right? And no one likes to be in that position of power. And you, abusing that power is never a good thing for anyone kind of involved. And so we have this notion that we are in communion with other people, right? It's not just about me. It's not just about us. It's about where we live and who we influence and who we kind of impact and who we live our lives with. And so it's this worldwide ecosystem and how this world kind of works in unison or should and maybe ideally that's what God kind of wanted. You see, nothing is really created in the world to exist for itself or by itself or alone, right? Now think about it. You have uh, creatures that 99% uh, of them have to have a mate to reproduce. Uh, there's a delicate balance with the ecosystem in the world. You know, that whole kind of food chain thing, that circular thing that we remember from third grade, right? With us at the top and eating, or these other creatures that eat the plants that do this and feed, and kind of feeds the world. And so when we think about the world and the creation of it, for the first three days, the God is busy creating the actual habitat, the structure and light, the sky and water, and then land and plants. 
And then the next three days, God is filling that inhabited or habitat with inhabitants, which ironically kind of fears the first three days of creation. The light bearers, the bird and sea creatures, and finally the land, animals, and humans. So each of these parts contributes to the whole. We're all tied together. And I think that's the danger that we run into in this world as well. We feel that we're autonomous and we're all by ourselves and we can do anything by ourselves or for ourselves. But creation tells us we're all connected. We're all part of one another. And that kind of goes back to the Trinity puzzle. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, always connected. Working together in harmony and unison. And so, you see, in God's creation, we have this extremely a complex world that we live in. It's flexible, it's dynamic, it contains involuntary organs, detailed systems, molecules, and so many moving parts that it would just make our head spin thinking about them. You know, if I had to control all my involuntary organs, I'd probably just sit all day. It'd take too much work to do anything else. I'd say, okay, heart, keep on beating, lungs, keep on breathing. A gallbladder keep on being useless, I guess, I don't know. And so somehow all of this works together. This very delicate balance in this world. To ensure that life continues to thrive and the inhabitants here on earth continue to flourish and nourish and help one another. In fact, all of us were created to serve God, not for God to serve us. And this is also important to remember when it comes to God. And I think some people get that the other way around. The hope is for this year, oh, what is God going to do for me? How's God going to make my life better? Instead of thinking, how can I serve God? What can I do for someone else? Or my family, or my community, or my church, or my school? Uh, what ways can I serve this world and serve God? God. You see, our primary function should be loving God, worshiping God, caring for creation, reflecting the love, the grace, and the kindness that God has shown us. And that should be reflected in our daily thoughts and actions. And we should never forget the two greatest gifts that God's given us, right? Life, and just life itself, it's very important. And then eternal life. A promise that death doesn't have the final word. It will live on past this life. And so what could be greater gifts than those two gifts itself? And we can be assured that God loves creation as well. I feel this is evident in all the beautiful, vibrant joy, the colors, plants, animals that we can see in creation. The things in the ocean, flowers, trees, uh, mountaintops, hillsides, deserts. All this beautiful creation that God has given us. But it can also be extracted that God especially loves humans. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul himself states that we are God's accomplishment. Paul says that about humans. That God created all of this stuff, and then eventually humans were created. And Paul proclaims that we are God's accomplishment. Furthermore, the primary aspect of humans is that we are only, uh, we are not all only created, but we are created in God's image. So there are no plants or animals or creatures that share that image of being created in God's, but it's us. You see, being God's accomplishment and having that hope that we are cherished and loved by God is reflected in the fact that we were made in God's image. You see, the irony is that Throughout history, people have often made statues in the image of God, right? When all along we've been made in that image. We're the living reflection of God. And so there's a great deal of hope and responsibility found within that. You see, David Blend, professor of homiletics at Harding uh, Theology School, had this to say about being created in God's image. He mentions how this is one of the reasons that God insists on Israel not making images of the God they worship. That God's image is already placed within humans. And no other kind of representation is necessary. And so as God's image bearers, male and female are given a responsibility. 
to have dominion over the created order. The humans are given dominion, not domination. They are caregivers, not exploiters. But we do unto creation as God does to us. But we express love and care toward the world. And yet we do it with dignity, uh, regardless of race, gender, social or economic status. Uh, we are the heart of the world. So this world was created for God, but we are entrusted to its care. Which gives us a great sense of responsibility and worth and meaning and hope as well. So, uh, over the course of the past few years, it's kind of become a bigger trend, is this desire to go green, right? So basically just living, uh, we reduce our carbon footprint on the world and uh, do a, a much better job of recycling or taking care of this planet. And so, having these energy efficient appliances and doing all this other stuff are little steps that we can all kind of take to make sure that we are caring for this world. Is there other ways to uh, live green include using light bulbs that last longer than a year or two or trying to cut down on our waste, uh, being more intentional with recycling? All these different things that God has kind of entrusted with us to care for this planet and reducing products that are harmful to the atmosphere. Now I'm not here to argue whether there is or is not climate change or global warming. That's not what I'm saying, but regardless if there is or is not, we can still do our part to make this world a better place, right? We can do it to ensure that there's hope for the future, for our children, for our children's children, and for many generations beyond that, by reducing the damage that we kind of do to this planet. And please note and remember, it's dominion, not domination. It's a big difference. We're entrusted with its care and to ensure its long-lasting sustainability, viability, and livability. And so we have to ensure that our children have a safe, clean, nice environment to live in and grow up in. Well, last night, my uh, family and I went to watch a movie at the Science Center. It's called The National Parks Adventure. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's really a great film. And it taught us, you know, how important these parks and this nature and this ecosystem really is. When Teddy Roosevelt realized that, he made the national parks and said, you know, these are protected spaces um, of greenery and nature that we should enjoy and appreciate and love. And one thing I didn't know is that the redwood forest, all those giant trees, uh, was 95% cut down. Uh, there was 95% of it that was chopped down in the early or late 1800s uh, using it for lumber. Only 5% of it survived. So now we have these national parks that protect these kind of treasures in our world. And I feel we're better off for that. And so if you get a chance, go see some national parks and enjoy them, right? But just be safe. Don't cut down any trees. But this world is a place that we're meant to care for. It's a place that gives us great hope. It's a place that gave God great hope when God first created it. And so in regards to this whole kind of Trinity puzzle, we have to remember that scripture is theocentric, not a Christ-centric. Meaning that we have to remember that there's more to God than just Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus is important. Don't misconstrue my words and say, oh, pastor said we don't need to worry about Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that like the world, there's more to it with God. And so with God, there's more to God than just Jesus Christ. There is a God that loves us, that created us, and continues to create. And this world is part of God in, throughout, and continuing to grow in life. So we're given this understanding of Scripture, and we're continually given more pieces to God through the reading of it, and the participation in church, and communities, and families. We can kind of peel back God's onion and know more about God. And what we'll find is that we have a God that loves us dearly, that wants the best for us, not only us, but those around us. A God that wants us to care for this world in which God created. And that, my friends, is a way that we can get hope and give hope to others. I often like to say my one big dream for the church is that it's a, kind of like a lighthouse for people, a place where people can find hope. Hope through God, 
hope through what we give or what we offer to people. So if they're struggling or if they're out at sea and they have these rough tides or these rocks that they just can't find their way, they can find the lighthouse of the church and of God. And that can bring them home. And to me, that's where we find our hope. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in this world. And we have to approach each day with a certain sense of hope. We have to believe it'll get better. We have to believe it'll change. We have to believe that we can change and we can make a difference in this world. And through how we treat other people, through our caretaking of this planet, and through our dedication and faithfulness to serving and loving God. And that, my friends, is how we get hope and how we give it to others and how we live and how we are carried by our own hope. Amen.